Well, good morning and welcome again to Word for the Week. My name is Pastor Jeremy Heidkamp and I'm the senior pastor at Cornerstone Faith Community Church here in Bloomingdale, Illinois. And it is indeed my joy uh, to be with you this morning as we continue our look at uh, The Discipline of Grace by Jerry Bridges. Uh, today we are going to find ourselves in chapter 7 where Bridges is, uh, has titled this chapter Obeying the Great Commandment. Of course, what he means by the great commandment is what we read in Matthew chapter 22 and several other places, Deuteronomy 6, for example, um, where in Matthew 22, Jesus is speaking. Uh, he's speaking to the Pharisees who have said to him, ha asked him, um, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus responds to them by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the first and greatest command. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. And so we see that we have been commanded, if you will, to obey this particular command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Deuteronomy 6 tells us. Uh, I thought this was a great chapter, uh, very well written. I loved <coughs> Bridges' use of uh, cruise control as an example or an illustration of uh, what happens when we are, are loving God, but not loving him with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole strength, for example. And so if you uh, want to turn in your books, um, Discipline of Grace, to page 106, the second page of chapter 7, I want to start where, um, uh, where Bridges is asking a question here. He says, what does it mean to love God? This is an important question. After all, Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. To love God with all my heart and soul and mind obviously means to love him with all my being, with everything that I have. And if I am to love God with this total wholeheartedness, then I need to know what it means to love God. So I began to study this passage in Matthew, Bridges says. Um, and he talks a bit about what he found as he studied this passage in Matthew. And of course, it uh, led him uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, and, and then throughout the rest of the book of Deuteronomy, finding um, at least six instances, there's actually many more, of this same command, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Um, on page 107, Bridges breaks down this idea of loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. Um, and he says that there are some primary ways that we're told um, to be obedient to this command. Um, for example, we are to observe all of the commands. We are supposed to keep all of the commands. We are supposed to obey all of the commands. We are supposed to uh, make sure that they are written upon our hearts and on the hearts of our children. We are supposed to impress them, uh, impress them, make an impression with them on the hearts of our children. Um, and then, of course, we are supposed to tie them to our hands and put them over our doorposts uh, at every moment of our life. And in particular, you know, so we're supposed to do that with every one of God's commands, right? The Ten Commandments and every other command that God has given to us. But in particular, we're talking about this particular command to love him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. In the rest of the chapter, Bridges spends most of the time talking about obedience. What does it really mean to be obedient to that command? What, what does obedience actually look like if, if we're really going to love uh, the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength? If we're really going to love our neighbors as ourselves, what does it look, type, look like to actually be obedient to him? And I think he really gets to the heart of of this matter when we get to page 111 in this chapter. 111, the second paragraph reads this way. Once we have arrived at a comfortable level of obedience in our lives, once we feel like we've gotten to a place where we are actually, oh, you know what, I'm obeying God pretty well here. I'm, I'm doing pretty well. Things are pretty good. This is where Bridges says we, we, we push the cruise control button. Now, 
before we move on reading the rest of the paragraph, what he's talking about here is when you use cruise control in your car, right? He talks about how, you know, if you don't use cruise control, you have the, um, the nuisance or the annoyance of having to utilize your foot on the accelerator back and forth, and eventually your foot becomes tired of having to do that, and there's inconsistency in your speed and all other kinds of things. So the beauty of cruise control is that once you get to the speed you're supposed to be at, you can click this, this cruise, cruise control button, and then you don't have to worry about things like speed limit because it's going to stay at the speed limit. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're exceeding the speed limit. You can kind of sit back and relax, and you don't have to worry about the fatigue of your foot going back and forth. And so, you know, cruise control when it comes to our cars, that's a pretty cool thing. But is it good when it comes to our obedience of God? And so, back to this second paragraph on page 111. Once we've arrived at this comfortable level of obedience, we push the cruise control button in our hearts, ease back and relax. Our particular Christian culture then takes over and keeps us going at the accepted level of conduct. We don't have to watch the speed limit signs in God's word. We don't, uh, we, we, and we certainly don't have to experience the fatigue that comes with seeking to obey him with all our heart, soul, and mind. This is what I call cruise control obedience, and I fear it is dis disrupt descriptive of many of us, if not most of the time or all of the time. The point here is this. Um, there is no level of obedience that you reach this level and there's nothing more that you could do to obey God. And so there is no level of obedience at which you get to press the cruise control button and just sit back and keep rolling at that level and, and, and not ever think another thing about God's word or not ever think another thing about um, the, the warning signs he may be giving you or, or the need to speed up or slow down or, or change anything. The opposite, of course, of this cruise control idea that Bridges brings up is the race car idea. And he talks about how with the race car idea, you know, when you have a race car driver, they're never going to use cruise control. That would be silly. They're always trying to speed up or slow down, move in and out of the rest of the traffic of the cars. They're trying to drive aggressively. They're trying to drive with purpose. And so um, we should be with our love for God, our um, obedient love for him. Probably the most favorite paragraph I've had so far in this entire book comes at page 112. The bottom of the page, God is not impressed with our worship on Sunday morning at church if we are practicing cruise control obedience to the rest of the week. You may sing with reverent zest or great emotional fervor, but your worship is only as pleasing to God as the obedience that accompanies it. I think a way we could think about that, of course, when it comes to our obedience is, you know, for some people, they have a personality, they have an attitude, they have a life that is their Sunday morning personality, their Sunday morning attitude, their Sunday morning life. And it's very different maybe from their Tuesday morning life. And so I would ask the, this way, you know, what good is a Sunday morning Christian on Tuesday morning, for example, you're only a Christian on Sunday morning when you're at church singing and praising where people are seeing you or something of that nature. You know, God demands obedience from us no matter what the day is, no matter what the hour is, no matter what the situation is. And the obedience that he demands from us is that we would love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's amazing. Um, Bridges then talks about this idea of love as a motive. And I was actually thinking this before I read the rest of uh, Bridges' chapter this morning about how, you know, love is a lot of different things. Love is an action. Love is something that I do. I love my wife. I do things for her. I, 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 I say things to her. I comfort her. I support her. I, you know, whatever. The list is, in, is forever long. I love her in those ways. But I also... Um, I also help, for example, I help her. Why do I help her? Because I, I love her. So the love isn't the action in that particular instance. It's the, the, the motive, Bridges says, for my helping my wife. I help her because I love her. 
I don't want to see her suffer, so I take care of her because I love her. There's a, a motive in our love. The issue with this idea of sort of wholehearted, whole-minded, whole-strengthed love that we are called to of God our Father is the motive of it. Not so much what are we doing, but why are we doing it? On page 114, Bridges says this, Love for God, then, is the only acceptable motive for obedience to him. This love may express itself in reverence for him and a desire to please him, but those expressions must not must spring from love. Without the motive of love, my apparent obedience may be essentially self-serving. Negatively, I may fear God will punish me or at least withhold his blessing from me because of some obedience. I may abstain from a particular sinful action out of fear I will be found out or because I don't want to feel guilty afterward. Positively, I may be seeking to earn God's blessing through some pious actions. I may conform to a certain standard of conduct because I want to fit in with and be accepted by the Christian culture in which I live. I might even obey outwardly because I have a complaint, a compliant temperament. And it is simply my nature to obey my parents or my teacher or civil authorities or even God. All of these motives, Bridges says, both negative and positive, may result in an outward form of obedience. But it is not obedience from the heart. Our behavior may appear outstanding to other people, but not be acceptable to God, because it does not spring from the motive to love him. Only conduct that arises from love is worthy of the name of obedience. And so God says, I want you to love me. I need you to love me. And we might respond to God and say, well, but God, why should I love you? Or, or someone may ask us, why do you love God? What's there to love about God? Well, I love God because he has loved me. John told us that, right? We, we, know what, we know what love is because he has first loved us. I love him because he loved me. And in response to his love for me, I want to love him back. What's the best way I can love him? To obey him. Just like with our earthly parents. What is the, the greatest way we can show that we love our parents? When we obey them. When we obey as, as they would protect us, to try, try to keep us safe, or, or whatever the situation is, our obedience to them shows them love. It is not the only way we show love, but it is a very important way we show love, is to obey what they have said. And same thing with God. Um, we don't only love God by obe obeying him. But if we're not obeying him, it, we're really hard-pressed to show that we love him in any way. And so our obedience to him helps us to have this whole-minded, whole-strength, um, whole-being love. At the very end of this uh, chapter, very last paragraph, Bridges writes this. He says, To the degree that we live with an abiding sense of his love, God's love for us in Christ, to that degree we will love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. So, as we turn our attention in the following chapters, which we'll talk about later on, to personal disciplines that we need to practice in the pursuit of holiness, let us not put the gospel on the shelf of our lives. Let's review it daily in the joy that it brings pursue these disciplines his point being this we can talk about all of these other disciplines prayer quiet time uh, serving um, caring all that kind of stuff we can talk about all those other disciplines only once we've actually figured out what it means to really truly love because if our quiet time isn't born out of our motive to love God then what's the purpose in it if our serving isn't born out of the motive to love God then what's the purpose in it if our um you know, words of, of rebuke that we have to bring on someone in, in some particular instance is not born out of love, then what's the purpose of them? Everything we do has to be born out of our love for God. And so the very first command, the most important, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in obedience to that love, then love your neighbor as yourself. 
I hope you enjoy this chapter. Um, it's, uh, I think, a really great one. It starts to bring the whole of all the book, all the chapters we've already read together with what we're about to read in the, the last half of the book. Um, I look forward to being with you again next week. Until then, I hope you have a very blessed week, and um, I, I hope that you'll just have great opportunities um, in your life uh, to love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole strength. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.